yeah, this is me. Uh, my name is Kaspers, uh, and I'm a senior product designer at uh, Printify. If you're from here, you might have heard of Printify, but in case you're not aware, uh, we are a platform that essentially connects online sellers who have stores on Etsy or Shopify, etc., to manufacturers who can produce products for them. So maybe you want to sell your t-shirts, your art on posters. We kind of manage that whole thing for them, so you don't need to worry about inventory and things like that. So that's us. Um, we have an office not so far away in speech at a district, so if you're passing by, you see the logo, you can wave and maybe we'll see you. Um, so that's me. Uh, actually, this is my first time in Riga in a product design meetup, so a bit of a milestone for myself. Um, I used to spend some time abroad, uh, lived about nine years in Amsterdam, worked in a few startups in uh, AI, machine learning, space, computer vision, things like that. I um, also spent a couple of years in London, so been around a little bit and moved back here in 2020 when I joined Printify. So here we are. But I'm not really going to talk about myself that much here tonight. I'm uh, actually going to focus on some habits that I think could be beneficial for uh, designers. And uh, so I've got five of them tonight. Now, why habits? Um, habits are things that are kind of invisible to us. They can be, certainly. So these are the things that we do quite often. Um, for instance, I drink coffee every morning. That's my habit. I brush my teeth a couple of times a day. That's another habit. So this is something I don't really pay much attention to. But in design, we have similar things that kind of fulfill our day and they become our invisible work. And I would like to kind of highlight them here tonight and uh, put them into the limelight and um, kind of dive deeper into these habits. So, and before that, I'd just like to take a quick note on a concept called the Keystone Habit. A uh, Keystone Habit is essentially a habit that can create other habits out of it. So, let's say my habit is exercise. Um, I'm going out, I'm working out. As a result of that, I <clears throat> might be starting to eat better, so healthy food. Um, that becomes another habit. As a result of that, I may be able to sleep better. And as a result of that, I might have increased focus. So based on a single habit, multiple things can change and cascade down the line, which kind of have a positive effect on your lives. And the habits that I'll mention in a minute, I see them as keystone habits too, but in design space. So things you can do consciously to kind of improve and create other smaller habits around it to um, improve your work life, essentially. So let's dive in. First habit, getting close to the user. So what do I mean with getting close to the user? So um, as a designer, I would love to speak with users every day. I wish there was like a room full of people just like you all, which are users, which I could go to and grab and ask them questions. They could provide me with some feedback, some pain points that they're experiencing, etc., etc. But that's not usually the case. So um, there are a couple of ways we can work around that. The first one, user interviews. Um, kind of an obvious one, not really a groundbreaking concept necessarily, but um, it's still a very good thing to do. So what we do is, yes, we have user interviews. We structure them online. Uh, our users are pretty much all in the US, so it's kind of hard to do them on site. But yeah, we run online calls on Zoom or Google Meets where we talk with them about what their problems are and their user journeys. Uh, if you want to validate something specific, we'll show them a prototype or a prompt and kind of work around that. Kind of a casual conversation about one hour long. It's very straightforward. But we can't really do interviews every day, unfortunately. So there's other things that we do. Comments on social media. Now, this sounds like procrastination, but it's actually work. Um, if your brand is active on some social platforms like Facebook or Twitter, and probably it is, 
then users are leaving a lot of really good feedback there. And we look at them and we read them too. It kind of looks like that. These are some comments that our users are leaving on our Facebook group. And there's tons of good stuff. And why is it useful is that there's no uh, in-between layer. So they're not talking one-to-one -to, -one to me personally, but they're just talking on social media. So they can be quite direct and uh, yeah, there's less filter. So they can be more honest and uh, it's a good way to gauge for popularity of themes or issues or topics, judging by how many likes have that has that post got or how many comments are there. So that's a nice thing to look at. Another one is user form feedback. These are also essentially user comments, but uh, we will ask them in different places in their user journey. So these are like little pop-ups on screen that users see with a question. Let's say, how did you rate your experience from one to five, from one to 10? And then there's like a comment section at the end that they can just add some whatever feedback they got. So we have a tool called Chattermill, which kind of collects all that feedback into one place and analyzes it by sentiment. You could see which comments are positive, which ones are negative, which ones are neutral. You can filter them out and just read them kind of like comments in social media as well. And also, there's no filter. They're just leaving comments to a random website. So there's a fair amount of profanities there too. Uh, we read them, we don't reply to them, but we read them and yeah, we also make product decisions based on what they're saying here. And the last one on this habit, those are watch parties. It sounds more fun than it actually is, but it is still fun. Now, watch parties are essentially meetings where we get together as a cross-functional team, designer, uh, developer, product manager, things like that. We gather together and we watch essentially what users do, kind of uh, user session replays. So we have a tool which looks like this. It records everything that the user does, uh, whatever they click on, where they navigate, what they see. We can replay that and, and watch their journey. Some, of, some things are not fully recorded, but there's uh, you know, privacy reasons and stuff like that. But um, yeah, those are meetings where we kind of gather together on a, maybe a Friday night or Friday evening where We'll spend about an hour just by replaying these sessions um, and having some fun. Uh, a good focus for these meetings is maybe thinking about the feature that we have released and we want to check how users are interacting with it. So we'll kind of filter sessions based on that. Or if you don't have anything specific in mind, we can just watch random sessions and have some fun as well. It's a great way to build empathy uh, towards uh, the user uh, along the team, especially among engineers who are kind of a little bit separated from that uh, focus uh, within the user. So that's habit number one. Habit number two is to have a system. Now, I don't really mean a design system, although that's very good to have as well. Uh, I would say even essential thing to have. But uh, what I mean with a uh, system is a systematic way of how to think about user problems and solutions that we are working with. And there's a concept called uh, Opportunity Solution Tree. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of it and maybe some of you are already working on it. If you have at least heard of it, could you please raise your hand just so I, I know what's the temperature? Okay, quite new, good. Uh, then I'll just dive deeper. So this is how it looks very briefly. We start with a desired outcome. This is the thing that we want to achieve as a team. So let's say if we have a fictional e-commerce store, our desired outcome might be to increase, increase customer uh, loyalty or customer satisfaction. And we have a way of measuring that as well. So that's step one. Step two, is we have a user need, pain or desire that we have discovered through research, through getting close to the user. So through the interviews, through comments, through watch parties and other things as well, we have uncovered some user problems that kind of relate to that outcome that we want to achieve. Next, we will have solution to that user problem that we know. Once we have a defined problem, it's quite easy to come up with solutions. So this is pretty straightforward. And lastly, we'll have quick tests to check if that solution works or doesn't. So we can check for things like desirability, uh, feasibility, viability, and usability aspects. 
And I'll show you a little bit more detailed way of how this might look in the practice. So I'll walk you through it. So we start again with desired outcome. For us as a fictional e-commerce company, it might be to improve customer satisfaction. And we'll measure that by look, paying attention to CSAT score, which we want to increase from 4.5 to 4.7. And we have uncovered two user problems that we think relates to that. Uh, let's say our users don't remember their credit card data. And we know that users want to see more products on our website. So this could have an impact on customer satisfaction. For one of these problems, so let's say users don't remember, uh, can't remember their credit card data, we can come up with multiple solutions as well. So it could be we can add Apple Pay and PayPal as a payment method. We could offer them to save credit cards so they then don't need to remember these, these numbers and names and those combinations. And we can get rid of cards altogether and offer them to pay on delivery, maybe with cash. So again, if we focus on one of these solutions, say Apple Pay and PayPal payment methods on our website, we can test these. So we can check if users want to use them, desirability aspect, so users actually want to pay with these methods. We can check desirability if they understand how to use them, if they know how it works. And we can check for viability internally, maybe within our team, to make sure these providers don't hurt our margins so we can afford actually to implement them. So that's the basic structure. So we go from the outcome to the problem, to the solution, to the way to test them. And it's a visual way of representing it. And this is an actual screenshot from our solution trees in Printify. It's hard to read though, but um, as you can see, there are many trees, it's not just one. Because these things kind of grow and evolve over time, you have a start somewhere, but then as you go with your product discovery, you learn about new things, uh, new problems, you keep adding those things there, and the solution tree grows over time. But what I would like to emphasize here is that we have color-coded some parts of it. So the parts in green are the things uh, those are assumptions or user tests or, or things we checked uh, whether that solution works. So in green, those are the things that we have validated. So we can make sure that this solution works. And we, we are actually working on it then. And the parts in red, we have highlighted, those are the tests that failed. Maybe solution wasn't usable or desirable or we couldn't afford, uh, afford to build it now. So we can mark it as red and on a high level, we can quickly see everything that we're doing and why. How does that relate to the desired outcome that we want to achieve? Because it really is about the outcome and not about the output. So we could work on many of these solutions. It doesn't matter which one works, which one doesn't. As long as we can get to the outcome, that's the only thing that we care about. A quick note here about uh, yeah, OKRs. Uh, if you're working with OKRs, this, I think, is a great way to kind of blend these two concepts together. So objectives and key results, right? So objectives is uh, something that you will probably define with a team for your next quarter, for your next half a year. Um, and this kind of nicely fits within the opportunities in Solution Tree, because that's also the outcome that we want to achieve. So if you have defined OKRs, then pretty much you have the first step taken care of because you know what you want to achieve and you have a way of measuring it because key results are measurable. Let's move on. Now, this is all very serious things that we're talking about. We have systems and, and research and, and interviews and things like that. It can, be, it can be fun. It is fun for me as well. But we are designers, right? So many of us come from different backgrounds, myself included. I come from a graphic design background. So from time to time, I want to do something else. So I want to focus my energy and build a habit around having fun too. And how to do this? Well, again, yeah, there we go. So there's multiple ways we can do this too. So if you like photography, for instance, and this is also a screenshot from our internal Confluence page, which is not really going to qualify for any design award, but um, nonetheless, we had an initiative some time ago where we wanted to improve the look and legibility of internal Confluence pages so that people can quicker filter the information that they need so that they know where they are and things like that. 
So as a designer, if you like photography, you can just step in, take some nice looking photos, maybe collaborate with someone else to create banners that would kind of highlight this section that you're looking at. So it's a way to do something that you really like and also help others by uh, improving inter internal pages, which usually um, aren't that great. Um, if you like iconography, well, there's many chances you will have to create custom icons at some point. We're using an open source icon library with lots of icons, um, but we still need some specific icons from time to time anyway. So we'll have to create them customized. Or if you like animations, you could define animation presets for drop downs, for overlays, for navigations and things like that. So again, another way to utilize some of your unique skills that you might not be able to, to do otherwise. Uh, well, myself, I like to doodle and illustrate and, and do things like that. So this, this is what I do sometimes to uh, maybe emphasize the point that I'm making or try to explain a concept that might be difficult to understand. So I like to throw these in sometimes. Um, that's kind of my personal thing as well. So it doesn't matter what you really like to do out of your daily grind, perhaps. Uh, just the bottom line is find ways to contribute to what you're really passionate about. Um, and don't wait till somebody asks you to do this because nobody will really know. So just step ahead and, and do this on your own and then people will notice and everybody wins in the end. Habit number four. Obsession over quality. I think this comes easy to designers, but um, this can be quite difficult to kind of pinpoint because it's a very kind of abstract concept. And so cultivating that as a habit can also be difficult. So I think if you want to start and be this warden, this ambassador of quality for product design, we pretty much have to start with ourselves. And so, uh, well, let's take a look at our design files. Let's make sure everything is aligned and using the pixel grid and the layout uh, presets that we have defined, all these things, of course, are good. Um, also, the file structure themselves, how we name things, how we organize our work. And this is probably what we do in our handover files, the, the final files, or the files that we are sharing with others. But the challenge here, I think, is to do this everywhere, to kind of cultivate this as a mindset that I'm just going to do this as if somebody else uh, will have to come in and take over my work because you don't really know when this is going to happen. So always has this, always have this assumption in your mind uh, that someone might step in and look at your work in progress or your sandbox files. Um, so at the beginning, it probably will feel like friction, like unnecessary thing to do, but then just like a habit, it becomes your second nature, like drinking coffee in the morning and this is just gonna be a way you work. And I think it's a nice and respectful way to work uh, towards yourself and others. But zooming out a little bit, um, this is a very simplified design process. We are having some design phase, which then goes to review, to handover, to QA, to launch. And there's probably a loop back from launch to design as an iteration at some point. Now, in this simplified process, there's also a couple of ways we can step in as designers and make sure that uh, the quality bar is still high. Um, the first one, and probably the most obvious one, is the review phase. I guess most of you have some recurring meetings every week where you share your work with other designers and uh, they provide critique and you provide feedback to others. It's just a way to poke some holes and make the design a little bit more watertight, more uh, resilient to whatever may come later on. And then if you have a QA department, then fantastic. You can go ahead and collaborate with QA. Um, establish new relationships. If you don't have QA department, then you can just step in and talk directly with developers. Um, if they're using tools like GitHub or something else, uh, ask to be included, uh, ask to be, uh, or just step in into these discussions and uh, provide feedback proactively, because things are always looking a little bit different just before they get to launch. Right, so these are some of the tools. GitHub is the obvious one that I just mentioned. Uh, Figma, really straightforward. Go in, leave some comments here and there. Zeppelin, not so popular these days, but also quite similar to Figma. Leave some comments. You can also check back the history of design, see how it looked like uh, a couple of months ago. 
And then there's abstract for sketch. If your people are still using sketch, I don't know. Um, which leads me to my last and final habit. Try to find ways to learn. Now this is a very individual habit to cultivate because it's kind of hard to find a universal approach here. But for me personally, I feel like learning happens out of my comfort zone. So that's kind of a check that I can f sense if I'm feeling comfortable or not. So if not, then maybe there's some learnings I can take away from that. So if I'm drawing like this imaginary comfort zone uh, ellipse here, I would probably put you all in there right now, right? So you're sitting down, you're watching a presentation, maybe you're standing up, but everything is going well, nothing to worry about, it's quite comfortable. Um, for me, I'm uh, way over here, like way out of my comfort zone. Uh, this is not my usual habitat, I'm not really talking to people every day um, in a format like this, so this is the way I'm challenging myself and finding ways to learn. But not everybody wants to give presentations in front of people. Um, what, what if that's the case? So how do you find these aspects that you can challenge yourself? And here I have a very provocative question to you. Um, are you a rock star or are you a superstar? Now, maybe some of you know already who are, you know, who you belong to, which group. Um, but if you're not really clear what I mean with Rockstar and Superstar, then let me assure you, <clears throat> you can definitely be one or the other. Um, and you don't have to sing, that's the best part. So how do you become Rockstar? So if you're looking at designers, then Rockstars are people who are a source of stability in a team. So they're very deep into what they do. They have expert knowledge in their domain. Uh, rock steady growth because they like to learn and study things slowly. If you imagine them as a letter, then that would be like a T-shaped professional too, where the vertical part is your core domain, your expert knowledge, and a T, well, that's like the other skills that uh, the horizontal part uh, that you have gathered along the way. So your challenge might be to position yourself as an expert, right? To be thought leader in your field. On the flip side, we have superstars, which are, uh, there we go, superstars. Uh, slightly different breed of designers. Uh, these folks need a little bit more diversified set of challenges. So they get bored when they do the same thing over and over and over. So they will seek more opportunities frequently and different kinds of opportunities too. Uh, perhaps because of that mindset, they tend to move up the ranks a little bit quicker. So they grow through the career ladder a little bit faster. And uh, they're more like an X-shaped professional where they cover more horizontal ground but they lack some depth into these fields that they're kind of interested in. So a little bit more shallow knowledge. A uh, nice challenge for these kind of people might be to find new opportunities um, that go beyond design. Uh, mentor someone or look for a coach to mentor yourself, to push yourself to, to go and find these opportunities. So slightly different set of challenges. And here I would like to uh, emphasize that neither one is better than the other, right? So they're equally respected in a company, equally well-paid, equally desirable paths to go to. Uh, also, neither one is a manager or individual contributor. Like either one could be either one. And it's a spectrum too. So you can't be 100% one and 0% other, probably kind of belong somewhere in between too. Um, so let's look at some more detailed and more granular ways to find these challenges. And here I would also like to emphasize that no matter which one do you think you belong to or which one you would like to belong to, um, seeking feedback is probably the first and most important step because that's a sure way to step out of your comfort zone. Right? It's, um, it takes some courage to be vulnerable, to open up and accept criticism, process that and then work towards improving it. So for both of these types, I would put that as the first point. For rock stars in a little bit more detail, uh, we could look at courses, deep dives, maybe you want to read case studies, maybe you want to write case studies and publish them. 
you could set standards and guidelines for your team, how we work, how we collaborate, uh, both on very tactical design level, let's say design guidelines, or on process level, how we collaborate as a team. And for superstars, some unique factors there might be mentoring, again, to expose yourself to different kinds of people, get different kinds of opinions. Um, and maybe look for a mentor as well, like I mentioned just before, to push yourself to go beyond your team. Maybe you want to learn a little bit about product management. Maybe you want to discover something about how customer support works. So again, broaden that horizon instead of going deeper. So some of these ways could be useful. Now, let me just quickly recap everything that I've talked here with you tonight. So, first, we could just cultivate the habit to get close to the user, to bridge that gap between yourself and the people who you're designing for. Different ways to do that. Some of them are more fun, some of them are less fun. Um, different ways to achieve that as well. Then have a system. Structure your thoughts in a systematic way. Don't get lost about many opportunities, many solutions, many different outcomes. Find ways to structure that and be very confident in this ever-shifting space that you're uh, working with. Have some fun along the way. Don't get too bored. Find ways to contribute about the things you're really passionate about, whether it's photography, illustrations, or maybe even music. There's probably some ways you can use that too. Be that watchful eye over quality. Don't let it slip. Keep the bar high. And lastly, be a star, whether a rock star or a superstar. Find ways to challenge yourself and grow and be a star. So thanks for listening. That's all I had for you today. I'm uh, open for questions and happy to chat afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. A very cool presentation. Uh, I have two questions. One is more like a warm up question. Um, you said about watch parties on Friday evenings. Do you really guys meet on the Friday evenings to, to do that? Well, we do actually meet online. Okay. Uh, we work remotely. So it's a meeting that happens bi weekly. Dependence, it, it depends on to, like how team wants to implement it, really. Uh, there's no, like, like, you have to have this. Um, but yeah, usually it's bi-weekly, half an hour to an hour long at the end of the Friday. So it's kind of a nice way to finish everything up and feel like you're working, but not really, just having some fun. And uh, But yeah, doing it in the office would be my preferred way, because I think it's a little bit more engaging that way. And then, thank you. The other question is, about the tool where you can watch these uh, sessions. Uh, what percentage of uh, events in those videos you find like you're missing some information? Like uh, something happens and you're like, um, what he really want wanted to do there? Um, so these tools can be a little bit tricky. Um, we have had a few over time. Um, the key thing there is for you to be able to filter among many different things that the user can do. So you want to maybe filter by what element that the user clicked on. So then you need to find the right CSS class or element. Um, there's different ways to segment users too. You want to find out who the user is. Is it like a newbie? Is it more like an experienced user? So for these insights to be valuable, you want to be very specific. I actually mentioned these comments that people leave uh, with forums that we collect. Uh, we can see user ID there too, which is usually a number. So we can copy that ID, uh, paste it into that tool, and then we can see exactly what that user did when the comment was written. So sometimes they'll leave some very vague remarks that we're not sure what that really means. So we have a way to kind of go back in time and say, oh, okay, this is what this guy did. So this is how it typically adds value to us. But that's like a very tangible product knowledge, like, oh, we can solve this issue. The invisible value there is just sharing the, the user you know, mindset and how user generally behaves. Thank you for your presentation. And um, about um, last habits, uh, uh, who you are, rockstar or superstar? Uh, good question. So I'm, uh, I think myself as a rockstar a little bit more because I like to really study things properly and uh, Again, this is also a way to challenge myself. Like, am I really a rock star? Maybe I can be a superstar. Because, you know, nothing is really set in stone. Uh, but yeah, definitely I, I enjoy having a lot of knowledge about uh, certain things in the field. I've got many UX design books, conferences, and 
the thing about these learnings is also that the more you read, the more you realize that how much you don't know. So it kind of goes on and on and on. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a bit more into the rocky side. Thank you. I think my opinion, I think a good designer, usually it's a rock star. It's my thing because it's really very deep expertise and experience and other because uh, if it's a superstar, it's usually manager or marketologue or other who like speak and other. <laughs> Yeah, or you could be a designer in a early stage startup where you're doing everything and then you're a superstar. Um, so yeah, that's maybe another transition. Or maybe you just come in as a new designer, junior, and then you realize, oh, maybe I want to do something else. So yeah, you have a point there. Uh, thank you. It's been a very insightful presentation. I particularly like the second habit, but I have a question about the first one. Um, you mentioned that you have like four streams of uh, incoming feedback uh, from your user. And uh, given the size of the company, it must be a lot of information coming from different um, streams. Do you have like a particular, maybe your favorite method of how do you categorize the feedback and uh, how do you prioritize it? Mm. Well, my favorite, despite the effort that it requires, is still user interviews. Because you can really see like the full spectrum of what they're doing and why, and uh, yeah, you can get just gather more value out of it uh, that way. Um, categorizing it, uh, what I like to do is I like to think of user problems in is this a painkiller problem, like really severe thing that I need right now to solve my pain, or is this like a vitamin that adds some value but is not super important? And then last one is like a nice to have like a desire, like a dessert, uh, if we're talking about food. So this helps me to understand immediately what might be the priority that we're thinking of right now. If you're talking, about, and this is something that you can find through interviews only, because how they talk about things is pretty much going to reveal that, like what language they use, what tone of voice, uh, what gestures, you know, face, um, all that you can capture only in interviews so you can understand the severity of these issues or, or things that they need or want uh, that way. Um, so yeah, that would be my very favorite way of uh, conducting that. Right, so it's more like uh, the severity and not like a business need or um, something like a, a technical side that you'd need to improve. Um, it kind of encapsulates everything. So it can have a business need in there too. I mean, our users are also entrepreneurs, so they have their own businesses. Uh, but I guess with business need, you meant like the company business, right? So yes, there might be some, some of that in there too, especially if this is something that we are kind of testing out. If it's a feature that we released or uh, we just want to have feedback on something specific, this will inform whether our business needs, uh, if the assumptions that we made towards building that business need uh, or business case is, uh, are viable or not. So it can inform that too, but usually it's, um, we try to be user focused first. So uh, try to understand what they really want and trying to build that later on. Thank you. <laughs>